Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see a full house on a Monday morning here in Vegas. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming and uh, for caring about data security. My name's Colm. I'm a vice president and distinguished engineer at AWS. Uh, I work on EC2 and our Nitro system, but also cryptography uh, and things like how we do network encryption. And um, that means a substantial part of my job is just paying attention to how we protect data. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, how we run services, can run services where uh, they don't necessarily need access to the data just to be able to provide that service. Um, I think the most important principle in information security uh, is the principle of least privilege. Um, which, you know, you boil it down, essentially says folks should really only have the level of privileges that they need to actually do something, right? Simple, sounds obvious, not always easy to implement. And uh, this principle is at the center of our approach uh, to information and data security. Um, but, you know, it's a process of continuous improvement too. And we're constantly trying to find new ways where we can ratchet down permissions and privileges um, so that things really are as fine-grained, access is as minimal as possible. Um, and some of the techniques and some of what I'm going to talk about here are hopefully illustrations of that, of just, just how fine-grained, just how paranoid uh, systems. The, uh, when I started my IT career, which was uh, in the late 90s, uh, things were a bit different than they are now. Right, in, in, at least at that time, it was still common that if uh, you, know, you called uh, an IT support desk, that IT support desk might have access to you know, quite a lot of material. You know, I worked at an ISP in the late 90s, and the folks there running support, uh, if you had to call them about an issue or need your account reset or whatever, they essentially had godlike powers to just go do anything. Um, and and, uh, and, and fa fairly coarse grained permissions and so on. Um, but you know, as the industry has grown, as IT systems have become more and more important, um, uh, there's been general recognition that that's, that's, that, that that's just not good enough. You know, you can't, you can't have that level of broad access. And so these days, you know, in our industry and other IT based industries, there's general recognition from customers, compliance authorities, all sorts of folks that um, you know, things need to have some controls in place uh, because you need to worry about, well, you know, what, if, what if an administrator's account is compromised or uh, you know, what if a support personnel leaves their laptop somewhere and you know, sim simple things like that. And we've got all sorts of controls uh, that we are all used to now. Uh, ranging from you know some of the access controls I'm going to talk about to you know even simpler measures like like making sure that laptop is encrypted so that if somebody leaves it you know at the cafe or restaurant or whatever doesn't it doesn't necessarily matter right someone might steal it they might open it but they don't get any data right and that's that's more and more common but we want to as I was saying want to push the boundaries of that even further and if you extend the principle of least privilege as far as you can possibly go, you know, the least access or the least privilege you could grant is zero, right? And that's where we want all systems, you know, ideally every customer, every institution, everything that's out there that has to handle data should be able to get to a place where you know, those systems can be operated in a manner where you know, the folks doing support, system administration, you know, SRE, all of those skill sets really shouldn't need um, access to the data. But what does that involve? What does that take? So I want to walk you through just some simple examples of how things work today at AWS, just to give us some kind of grounding context. Um, the first is what happens now if you call AWS support, right? So um, we actually have a program at AWS where every few years, um, even if you don't work at AWS, at AWS support, you're encouraged to go sit down with them, work side by side with the support team for a day or two and handle customer issues just like they would and get a real feel um, for, for what customers are experiencing out there. It's just a practice we like. It keeps us grounded in the customer experience and you know, uh, means we have some real skin in the game to, to make sure that experience is as smooth as possible. 
And, uh, and my experience of this is when you sit down with those folks, they love to help people. That is what they live for. You know, every day, you know, they start with a meeting about, you know, what can we make even easier today? Or what are the top issues customers are experiencing? How can we make that go away? And so on. And in a way, it would be more convenient and easier for a lot of customers if AWS support could just go do things on customers' behalf. You know, customer calls and says, I've got a problem with my EC2 instance, or a problem with my S3 bucket. Well, you know, wouldn't it be convenient if the support personnel could just go, you know, log into the instance or something like that? But that's absolutely not how it works. There's, there's no way they can do that. And the only times where, you know, AWS personnel might be able to do something like that on behalf of a customer, where it's very clear and there's upfront consent and so on. So maybe we're doing a professional services engagement or, or a, a building a managed application or something like that. And then the access is done in the completely normal ways, the same way the customer would. You know, they're given uh, an access credential, their access is logged, all of those kinds of things. Um, and that's a very, very rigorous process that we, we have a lot of controls around. Uh, Another example is the system I work on, EC2 Nitro. So the AWS Nitro system is uh, a security enhanced accelerated platform that we built you know, the last uh, six or seven years of EC2 instances on top of. And uh, that system was built from day one as uh, what we call a hermetic system, in which, which essentially means uh, we don't have any general purpose or administrative access to that system. So even, you know, even though I'm a senior engineer working at EC2, I'm very long tenured. Uh, I hope I'm trusted, you know, I'm in a, in a fair number of, of trusted programs at AWS. Even, even with all those caveats, uh, you know, I can't go and log into a Nitro system or see what's going on. And um, this can, again, introduce inconvenience and friction. If we've got a really hard to debug issue with a customer, you know, sometimes it would be nice to be able to just, you know, log into the system and attach a debugger or something like that. But we, we can't do that. Uh, instead, if it really comes to it, and thankfully this is very rare, you know, we have to work with the customer to reproduce their workload on some dedicated test infrastructure that they know is dedicated test infrastructure and does have some debugging capability. It actually runs a little slower because, uh, you know, it's in debugging mode and so on. But there's no way for us to go, you know, take a production instance and see what's happening inside it or anything like that. And that's very different, you know, to how systems used to be built uh, in the industry. And all of these are kinds of examples of uh, a kind of cultural tenet we have, um, which is that we consider customer data radioactive to us, right? We, we want to be able to host customers' data. We want to be able to serve it durably and give customers, you know, advanced services that give them insight or use of that data and so on. But we don't want to see it ourselves. Um, to us, seeing it is, uh, you know, it's nothing but pain. And so where, wherever we have customer data, we want you know, radioactive lead shielding and, um, and we want systems and processes in place that you know, give us some assurance that um, there are some measures bet between you know, us and some kind of inadvertent uh, access to that data. Now, before I go on and get into some real detail, uh, because we're touching on a topic that covers uh, you know, security compliance, uh, there's some disclaimers I have to give. Uh, the first uh, and most important is everything I'm going to talk about, it's not a compliance framework, it's not a checklist or a way to achieve certain compliance uh, measures. Uh, it, you know, if, if you're a customer and you're working on achieving um, a compliance measure with a compliance authority, we have the AWS compliance team who help customers with that. Those engagements tend to be highly specific. You know, regulators and compliance authorities tend to want to, you know, get deep and, and have very specific um, requirements each time, specific to the workloads and so on. And it's never quite as simple as a checklist. So keep all that in mind. Um, because of the nature of what I'm going to talk about, because we're building systems that are intended as defenses against uh, you know, what if a system administrator is kidnapped and, you know, try, someone tries to force them to do something? You know, how do you, how do you mitigate against that? You know, by, the, by that very nature, we're talking about kind of movie plot threats. Doesn't mean they're likely, but, you know, you still kind of have to design for them. And then last, if you do want, you know, official AWS statements uh, on these and on other, like, compliance-related topics, uh, we've got the CISO and Data Privacy Center um, 
pubs on our, on our public website, and they've got great jumping off points to all sorts of material. All right, so with that, with that let me get into some real detail. Um, so when we look at how we're hosting data, we want a process of continuous improvement in place, right? Where we want to be able to see, okay, how, what are the controls around that data? And, and what are we building into our control systems that mean we can uh, lock that down even further, right? We want a one-way ratchet on these things. We want to be able to, you know, next year we want better controls and the year after that and so on and so on. And, um, and that involves building uh, a whole culture of observability and insights in, into, you know, where the data is, what the kinds of data are, uh, and what kind of um, use is truly needed for services to do their job. And, um, and we do this, you know, not just for the kind of uh, movie plot reasons, like, you know, what if somebody is kidnapped or something like that, but also just as defense in depth against bugs and issues in systems. You know, what if you've got, what if you're running some software and that software has a defect in it, and maybe that defect might be exploitable, and then, you know, worst case, um, a machine uh, is compromised and, and someone who shouldn't have access has access. Well, how do you build the system in a way where there's still defense in depth that means there are measures in place that mean the data can't be accessed? This, these systems also tend to be great defense in depth against um, operational errors and mistakes. When you build systems that mean you, know, you can't access data, that also means, well, you can't go delete it by mistake either, right? And, or you know, uh, you've also got additional safeguards uh, around you know, making changes that might break a system and so on. So you get availability benefits too, uh, which is, which is um, I think, really, really great. And so when we approach the principle of least privilege, we're looking to, uh, I think, a much more fine-grained lens than is typical, right? We obviously only want to grant access when it's needed, but also like while it's needed, like for as short as time as possible. And we want systems and people to be able to prove um, that that access is needed. And you'll, you'll see just how fine-grained we go with that. Now, we operate a lot of services. And our customers operate, you know, uncountably more. And so when we're trying to drive these processes of continuous improvements, it's really useful to have measures for, uh, you know, what does success look like? How far along this journey are we? You know, what state can you get to? How can you set a realistic goal? Because that just, you know, helps you drive any, any process, continuous improvement. And you can see, well, are we, are we getting better enough, fast enough, uh, and so on. This has become particularly more important with customers in the last few years, where we've worked uh, very closely with some customers on their, you know, similar journeys, where, you know, due to their compliance uh, requirements, they have to lock down their access to data and so on. And just helping them, um, you know, measure where they are and assess, you know, hey, we'd really like to get to this state can be enormously simplifying. And so, uh, it's, it's also the case that not all systems, you know, require the same levels of protection, right? A really simple example is, you know, the service that's running uh, the AWS website, the public website, right? That does not need the same level of protection as S3 or EC2 or something like that because all the data is public. It's all out there on the internet, <laughs> right? So there are times where, uh, there are times where you can make uh, nuanced calls and decide, you know, what level of protection does that actually need? Um, but either way, we want to be able to integrate some form of isolation into our systems. So the way I approach this is to kind of uh, approach it with a model of, OK, well, we want to get folks to a world where they have zero privilege operations. They can run their systems um, without privileges or permissions to access the data. Uh, what does that journey look like? And I've laid it out as kind of five steps. Um, these, these steps don't have to happen strictly in order. They're all complementary. Uh, I'm going to talk about them in this order. But especially when you get to um, steps four and five, you know, they start to become very complementary, and, and, and bits of each make sense. But these are kind of the common waypoints on the journey um, that I've seen us take as we do this work on services, and I've seen customers take. And so the first step, and probably the most important step, 
is just to have some set of foundational principles as a business that essentially states, like, we're just going to be the kind of institution that respects data, right? We don't want to be able to access data. Uh, not all institutions have made that call, you know? Some, uh, some institutions are still, you know, um, where the ISP I worked at was in the, uh, in the late 90s. Um, and, uh, but taking this call, you know, alone, you know, making a simple pledge of, you know, we don't want employees to, to have permissions or be able to, to access things inadvertently, sends a very important signal about what the organization values. And it kind of accepts that trade-off of inconvenience. It kind of makes that statement that, you know, we're going to build our systems in a way where sometimes we might have to go through some extra permissions or extra steps to get some things done. But we think that's important because we think protecting customer data is paramount. And that is much more important. And so that's the trade-off we're going to make. Um, and that's, that's how we're going to order things. Uh, it's as simple as just essentially asking, you know, what would the customer want us to do with this data at every time? Essentially acting as a steward or a shepherd on their behalf. Um, now, taking this step can be as simple as, you know, writing it in the employee manual, right? You know, thou shalt not <laughs> access customer data, right? Um, uh, you know, make, making it clear that uh, it, it could be even a disciplinary issue. You know, I think that's one of the, the few things um, that could literally be, you know, a HR disciplinary issue, um, where if, if someone is inappropriately accessing data, that, you know, it's, it's a customer's data, they shouldn't be doing that. You know, that, that can be how, how things like that should be handled. Um, but it, it tends to require a bit more than that. You know, when, when you take this step, you do tend to have to sit down and go, well, what is customer data and what are the ways to classify it? Um, the common uh, kind of first take that you see people take on this tends to be, well, we've got the customer's own data, you know, the, the stuff that's very clearly theirs. Um, and then there's the customer metadata, right? Things like configurations or maybe, you know, the customer's uh, address details and so on so that you can send them a bill. And then there's system data, things like, you know, the system configuration, the system software and so on. Uh, almost always straight away, you see folks having to get a bit more refined and start to separate um, that metadata into things that might be privacy sensitive, you know, so customers can consider, you know, their contact details and so on, uh, privacy sensitive data. Um, and, uh, and, and metadata itself generally has some form of sensitivity, you know, just even the fact that a, a, you know, a customer is using a certain configuration or service and so on, uh, maybe they don't want the whole world knowing that. So you still have to treat that with some level of sensitivity. Um, but these, you know, these are pretty easy to map to kind of intuitive guidelines for how to treat these things. It's pretty clear that, the, you know, the, the clear customer data is just no one else's business. Um, and the rest you can, you can categorize uh, relatively easily. The, um, the next step in that journey, you know, once things have been classified, uh, tends to be, okay, well, we're going to try to achieve this objective as a team or as an institution or as a company. That's a, that's a business change, right? That's a business process change. Employees, administrators, support personnel might have to change how they do their jobs a bit. And so it's really critical to build in early um, feedback processes, you know, to get feedback from the folks who are going to be impacted by those changes and listen and, you know, are these changes feasible? Are they introducing too much friction? Um, you know, how workable is it? When we began our journey at, um, on this, I think, uh, you know, we, uh, security is our top priority at AWS. We really, really mean that. And so at, 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 uh, at all times, you know, we always want to emphasize, hey, we're, we're adding these new controls. Uh, they're not optional. You know, <laughs> you got you, you to gotta go uh, implement them and, and uh, respect them and so on. Um, but I th I, sometimes I think we didn't have enough feedback mechanisms in place to really hear uh, from team members, you know, how effective those controls could be so that we would get the feedback of go, well, you know, if you make this control, you know, 10% easier, my job will get a lot, a lot easier because I, I have to use this control, you know, you know, 20 times a day or whatever. Uh, and, and that can, you know, really matter for the impact of these things on a business. Um, but I think the great thing about these uh, and a great decision to make 
as an organization is to lean on automation. Because I think uh, the secret to, to building these systems is essentially to have all access to system guarded through tools and automation and systematic processes. And it's a great thing to do anyway, right? That generally removes toil from a lot of operators. Um, and so, it, you know, approaching it that way uh, can reduce um, a huge, a huge win. Um, and then for, you know, finding interesting data sets, uh, something I've seen customers do is um, use some of our machine learning systems, like Amazon Comprehend, to go hunt, you know, for what might be sensitive data sets. And I see also, um, yesterday we launched a new sensitive information uh, tool for, for CloudWatch 2. So there are automa increasingly there are automated ways to find and classify data. It's uh, it's it's pretty cool. You know, you can point you can point comprehend uh, at something like an S3 bucket or a data lake, and it can find okay, hey, you've got you know credit card data here or phone numbers here or things like that, and uh, straight away get a head start on you know what might be the data sets um, to prioritize. I've, I've certainly seen some customers go at it that way. Next, the kind of second step on these journeys. Um, that I've seen customers and institutions take are uh, what I call elemental protections, which are just kind of security protections that you're used to seeing that are mostly focused on making sure that you know, only the right set of folks ever have access to anything, that in general outsiders uh, don't have access to anything. So things you're very used to seeing in a lot of uh, you know, security frameworks, um, like SOC 2, for example, uh, you know, making sure data is encrypted, uh, whether that's durably uh, in storage or when it's transiting the network, making sure they're, they're tested backup and restore processes and so on so that we can uh, stand over the durability of data, that access uses multi-factor authentication uh, and, and so on. Uh, for the record at AWS, all of our network traffic, uh, everything in, in and out of an AWS physical uh, location is encrypted, often several times over. Uh, I've given uh, prior talks about that with, with more detail. Um, there's uh, literally, I think, points at which it's encrypted four or five times over, uh, depending on what the customer is also doing themselves. Um, so that's kind of seen as uh, ta table stakes today. Um, and Ensuring that you know at rest encryption is used appropriately for uh, sensitive data sets. Um, you know we support encryption at rest in in all of our storage services uh, and uh, AWS backup, and we've got protections built in to enforce that into our access uh, management systems and so on. But this, I'm not going to talk too much about this because there are 10 security talks every year at reInvent that kind of cover all of the stuff that's in step two. This is, this is the usual stuff that you're used to seeing, but you do have to do it. If you don't do this stuff, um, you know, the rest uh, is pointless, right? If, if you're not at least, you know, if you don't put those measures in place so that, you know, random outsiders don't have access to things, um, then trying to, trying to add e further defenses probably isn't the right priority. So the next step is where I think the cloud starts to really differentiate itself and where things get um, uh, really, really powerful for customers. And that's um, kind of before building, you know, the more sophisticated protection measures that I'm going to talk about, we actually encourage folks to focus on making sure you've got always on accountability and that every action that is taken can be traced to a person, right? whether that's the code they committed or um, an operational action or anything like that, that there are you know, logs and trails and so on in place uh, that can't be bypassed, that are you know, being saved to a durable, safe location so that everything can be accounted for. That's important for its own sake as a security measure, right? If an, if an inappropriate action was taken, you want to be able to provide it, or you, sorry, you want to be able to detect it, and that's a, that, that is a key thing. But it's also really important for driving the other changes, right? Y to know what to prioritize, which systems to focus on, where to put the next improvements. You kind of need measures of, well, what's happening, <laughs> right? And so having that operational visibility into what's actually going on really, really matters. And so at AWS, this looks like a few different things. Um, we are regularly baselining uh, who has access to what. 
So, and not just who, but you know, what systems have access to what. Uh, if, you know, if, you, uh, if you talk to some folks at AWS, they might tell you about baselining, which you know, once a quarter or once every six months, um, depending on the level of, of sensitivity, they're asked to you know, affirm, okay, this is the list of people, systems, whatever, who have access to this set of privileges or permissions. Um, and that's, you know, we're always reviewing that. Um, we have mechanized that. We have uh, put some smart learning around that to make sure that we can, you know, highlight interesting changes and so on so that um, people aren't just jaded and it doesn't just become this routine thing that no one really pays any attention to. Um, but it's a really, really important part of the process to make sure that we actually are confirming. Then the next thing we, we want to make sure people do and I've seen customers have to prioritize this especially, is eliminating anonymous shared accounts. You know, setups where, you know, the team of sysadmins or SREs just all have the password to, you know, the account that can access uh, the production machines or whatever. And so if an action occurs on those machines, you've no idea who did it. It could be any one of, you know, 10 people or whatever who, who have access to it. At AWS, uh, we use the IAM system internally as well, and so we use roles. Right? And we want people to assume roles, and we have traceability, so we know, um, we know who did what where. Uh, in rare cases, if someone does actually have to you know, log into a machine or use SSH or a system like that, it's actually done under their own username. Um, and so it's all, all traceable, uh, and, and, and we want it that way, and that's uh, uh, pretty important. Um, there are all sorts of systems that can help with this, but probably the AWS Identity and Access Management System is the most powerful one. But uh, all of our kind of system administration suite tools, um, like Systems Manager and Instance Connect and so on, uh, all you know, try to incorporate this tenet where you know, we want things to be traceable, whether you're you know, coming in over the serial console or using Instance Connect or Systems Manager. Um, that's uh, a really, really important principle to us. And because you know, the cloud is mostly built on APIs, um, it, by its very nature, right, actions are traceable. Right? You can enable CloudTrail or AWS Config or other tools, and they can keep an eye on you know, what, what, what are the API calls that are, are happening and making sure that there's a log of those. You know, I've, sit, I've sat down with many customers uh, and convinced them, like, if you do absolutely nothing else, if you're new to AWS, if you're just beginning on this journey, if you're experimenting, um, enable CloudTrail. <laughs> you know, check these boxes. Go turn it on for, for um, the important events. Uh, because if anything ever goes wrong, <laughs> like, you'll know who did what, whether that's a, a security event or, you know, an operational mistake. And it gives you something you can work backwards from and you know, undo, the, uh, un undo the mistake or whatever. Um, but it's really, really critical. Um, the uh, one thing to emphasize is these kinds of controls, you know, they're, just kind of, they're just built into the cloud, right? Everything, you call the API, it gets logged to CloudTrail. They're exceptionally rare in you know, on-premises environments and so on. So this is what I mean by where the cloud starts to differentiate itself and why I think um, that kind of security is, is like just one of those real force multiplier benefits um, that, that the cloud brings to the table. Um, all of this is possible because um, inside AWS, when uh, we are accessing systems, or when systems are accessing systems, you know, if you've got one service calling another service and so on, that's all mediated by the regular AWS IAM service uh, using SIGV4 um, signed requests that normal customer requests come in. Uh, everything is, we kind of use IAM as this ring fencing system that lets us implement uh, important controls and mean we can provide customers with you know, these event traces of, um, uh, that give them transparency of like, well, why, you know, why did system X access system Y? Well, it should be right there in a cloud trail log uh, generally. Uh, and, and we also use things like um, service principles. So when, for example, when S3 calls Lambda, Right, because you uploaded an object to S3 and you want to tell Lambda about it so that Lambda can do something. You know, that's generally done through something we call service principles. Um, 
And while the permissions are set up so that it works by default, you know, customers can go break it if they want. They can uh, remove and revoke access because we want, um, we want all of these permissions and privileges uh, transparent and, and with customer control. Uh, the policies we use for that access, uh, we publish, right? So you can, um, you can go look in our documentation and you can find the AWS managed policies, um, including ones that services use to access other services. They're up there. You can see what permissions and privileges uh, we're giving to our systems so that they, go, they can go do operations and, and go do things. And uh, people are free to audit these and confirm that they're you know, overly permissive um, and so on, which uh, I find really helpful. Now, one challenge with this is that managed policies, um, especially when you've got you know, a fine-grained or very capable service or relationship between services, it can get a bit daunting. You, know, you can have a long list of, uh, of things that uh, service X might be allowed to do uh, uh, on your behalf. Uh, we've also got tools to help kind of wrangle that down. And uh, my favorite is Access Analyzer which is a service we built using machine learning and automated reasoning uh, techniques that can look at policies and can answer really simple questions like, well, I don't want to read the whole policy. Just tell me who can access what, right? Or, if I, uh, or the other way around as well. You know, given a, uh, given a what, who can access it? And, um, and we actually run all of our managed policies, everything that we do, every change we make, everything we're doing on permissions, we run it through these tool sets, and they go through uh, you know, security approval processes um, that are somewhat centralized, and you know, teams can't just override or, or do anything um, to, to circumvent. And we confirm that you know, these permissions that are in place are appropriate and accountable. Right? Whatever actions are going to happen um, will uh, we'll get recorded somewhere, and so we can um, keep an eye on it. And that's, that's what account, always accounting, always on accountability tends to look like. Um, this level, I think of, you know, if you can reach this level, where you've got always on accountability, that's actually that's pretty good. That's uh, quite mature, um, and I see many customers achieve this. Um, you know, usually a matter of, of turning on CloudTrail and, and all those controls. And um, that puts you in a really strong position. You know, now, now you're in a place where if something happens, you do know about it, it can be detected, and you can prioritize. But we're still not quite in a place where there are actually zero privileges. Right? Now we're in a place where, well, if something goes wrong, if something inadvertent happens, we do know about it, but it's not quite preventative. So four and five are where that starts to come in. And the, the first is contingent authorization which essentially is um, we, we don't want it to be that something is just authorized to access a system or someone is just authorized to access a system. That's too, group, that's too crude, right? It's not fine-grained or granular enough. We want the access to be very specific and conditional, right? We want, it, we want uh, whatever is actually happening to be the thing that is approved and authorized, right? And we want it to happen only while it's needed. So I'll give you some uh, simple examples of just how fine-grained we go with that. Um, so I'm going to walk through how um, ELB, if you launch uh, an Elastic Load Balancer, how it gets access to your SSL certificate. Right? So uh, you can create a Load Balancer using ELB. You can create a certificate using ACM, Amazon Certificate Manager. And ELB can access that certificate. Now, in my opinion, that's a pretty important operation. SSL certificates are valuable, right? They can be used to impersonate uh, a website or an application or whatever. So it's important to have a lot of security around it. Now, when ELB accesses the certificate um, from ACM, it does it through IAM, like I said, using uh, SIGv4 signed requests. If you want more detail on how the SIGv4 protocol works, you can uh, read my blog post about it. Um, but the, the, the key to the keys here is that um, that system enforces uh, very, very stringent controls about the signing keys that are used. So when ELB is making a call into IAM, uh, 
just like a customer can, or sorry, into IAM and into ACM, just like a customer can, that key that signs the request, that's not the service principle key or an access key or anything like that. Instead, it goes through these steps of cryptographic derivation um, that mean the actual signing key is a unique per key, or sorry, per day, per service, per region key, right? So just starting out, we're saying that that signature that's actually used to authorize the request is highly specific. If that key, which you know, has to be in memory somewhere to sign that request, were somehow leaked or compromised, let's say due to a software defect, you know, the maximum impact here would be, well, it's, that key is only good for that one day, for that one service or service relationship in one region and so on. So it's highly, highly scoped down. Um, that's one example already of just how contingent we like to make things. But then the next thing that makes them even more contingent is it doesn't quite work like that. ELB doesn't have a key that just lets it ask ACM, hey, give me a certificate. I'd just like this certificate, please. That, you know, we don't think that would be contingent enough. Um, instead, the way it works is that when you call ELB and say, you know, I'm creating this um, low bouncer and I'm creating this certificate, it, the IAM system gives ELB a temporary credential that we call forward access sessions. And those are incredibly ephemeral. They're very short-lived. They don't last um, very long. And that is the key that is used to get a grant. That means it can access the certificate in ACM. Um, and this kind of on behalf of access gives us uh, some you know, really, really interesting security properties. It means that even in that worst case scenario of let's say the ELB service was somehow compromised, right? Some kind of a doomsday movie threat um, scenario. Well, there's nothing sitting in that service that would just let it get material out of ACM, you know? An attacker wouldn't just be able to go, you know, I'd like this certificate's key from ACM, please. Now, we could have built it that way, right? We could have said, well, you know, ELB is an AWS service, so we can trust it, and uh, it's, not, it's never going to ask for something it shouldn't, you know, be entitled to. Um, so, you know, let's just give it access to everything. That's just nowhere near contingent enough uh, for our needs. So we use this forward access session where, material where the only way the IAM system in ACM will give that certificate to ELB is if the customer has recently called ELB and therefore IAM released one of those forward access sessions. It's um, very, very temporary. We use this pattern over and over wherever we can. Uh, so it's, for example, it's how EC2 gets access to EBS volume encryption keys. Same process. Or if a service is launching a VPC private link endpoint, right? It obviously needs to be able to modify the VPC. So it uses forward access sessions. Or attaching VPC gateways. There are countless other examples. We use uh, forward access sessions in a lot of places. So that's two forms of contingency already. Right? We saw how narrowly we scoped the signing keys, and then we used very ephemeral session keys to actually get the material. Now that's for systems accessing systems. What if we have operators or you know, system administrators or folks who need to you know, administrate systems? How do we do that? Well, here's where we want to focus on. It's, you don't, again, you don't want to be just saying, you know, Colum has access to this system, and it's as simple as that. You know, that's the kind of 90s era Unix permissions model. Instead, we want to approve tools on a tool by tool basis and say, well, this tool can access the system because we vetted that that tool is safe. It doesn't access data. It doesn't do anything that's going to break the system. So we'll authorize that tool. And we'll do that generally using some form of cryptographic attestation, right? So we're essentially, it's kind of like biometrics for code, right? We're saying this tool, you know, this checksum or, you know, this vetted tool that no one can just circumvent or modify or whatever is what's approved. So if you need to do operation X, Y, Z, you know, use the tool. And, uh, and it will enforce safeties and it will make sure that you can't just um, inadvertently, you know, access some data and so on. There are ways uh, to build 
these kinds of contingent auth using AWS services, um, API gateway Lambda authorizers um, are an increasingly common way. And there are tools built into Systems Manager for doing this kind of contingency. Um, I've seen customers too use, uh, you know, you can layer on top other forms of contingency. You know, a simple one is, um, you know, maybe you need two people to approve an action, right, in real time, right, instead of, instead of one. Um, and so these kinds of contingencies, they really do provide, you know, preventative measures that mean, you know, X, Y, Z can't happen because the system just simply doesn't work that way. But you can get stronger still. And so you can complement um, contingent authorization with what we call hermetic systems. So these are systems that are generally uh, reserved for the kinds of data that has the highest levels of sensitivity, where you're using engineering techniques that mean there simply is no access to the data, right? Even if you tried to write a tool that could access the data, it, like it just wouldn't be able to um, because of the measures that are in place. And, um, and we have you know, examples of hermetic systems at AWS, I include the AWS Nitro system, but also our, our key management service, KMS, uh, and there are others. Um, these systems have no, just no general purpose or operator access. There's no administrative login. There's no way to just run commands. All of that just isn't part of those systems. These systems also generally incorporate a secure route of trust so that we can verify they're actually running the software and code that enforces those controls um, so that that can't, be, um, that can't simply be bypassed. And instead, you know, all access is via APIs. In the case of the AWS Nitro system, it's, this isn't just logical or software isolation. There's real physical isolation too. The AWS Nitro system um, mostly runs on AWS Nitro cards, which are dedicated you know, servers inside servers um, with their own CPU and their own memory that is not the same system that customer code is running on. So they're literally physically separate. You know, they're um, connected so that the Nitro system can manage um, the, the, the customer hardware, but they're not the same system. So it's this, you know, very, very strong level of isolation. Um, that model also means we're able to offer uh, bare metal instance types and uh, other performance accelerators. Now, when we built the Nitro system, when we were designing it at the beginning, you know, this, was, this was our main desire, design requirement. You know, we wanted the performance benefits. You know, that was the second <laughs> reason when we were building Nitro, but the first was security. We just didn't want to be able to see inside customers' instances or know what's going on. And uh, the kind of platonic ideal for that model, you know, computation is a very general purpose workload. Like an EC2 instance, customers can do anything they want on it. They can run any software they like. They can compile anything. It's very, very general purpose. So how do you build a very, very general purpose system that you can't see inside of? Well, the platonic ideal solution to this is cryptographic computing or uh, homomorphic encryption. It's, all, it's also called a very cumbersome term. Um, and we, we have a research group and a team that work on cryptographic computing, and we do have solutions in that space. Um, and there are interesting things you can do with cryptographic computing. But the major downside of cryptographic computing is it's incredibly slow. Uh, like, a billion times slower than regular computation. And so it's just not practical for um, most workloads or general purpose workloads. You, know, you couldn't run a web server uh, in, inside homomorphic encryption or something like that. So that didn't, you know, that didn't satisfy our design requirements. So then the next thing we looked at was like, okay, well we can't do um, you know, computational cryptography, but why don't we just do normal encryption? You know, why don't we just encrypt all the memory and then it's encrypted, so we can't see it. Uh, simple as that, right? Well, we do encrypt memory. Uh, you know, on, on our Graviton platforms, all the memory is encrypted. Uh, other, other platforms um, uh, have it too. And it's, uh, but there's a reason we didn't want that as the primary control. And the reason is uh, encryption is great for durable data. You know, you encrypt it once, it sits there, great. Somebody gets the encrypted data, they're not going to be able to decrypt it. You know, it's very little you can infer about that data from the encrypted copy. But computation doesn't really work like that. Because, um, you know, if you look at the plain text here on the left and the kind of encrypted version on the right, you know, the ideal in encryption is it just looks like noise, right? 
But as the data changes, so does the ciphertext, so does the encrypted version, right? So as the data is mutated by applications, by whatever computation is happening, you can start to see patterns, right? And those patterns are generally enough to work your way back to what's happening, right? In fact, this is what side channel research is, right? A lot of microarchitectural side channels focus on, you know, if you can figure out the patterns of access, then you can work your way backwards to maybe, you know, what somebody's uh, encryption key was or something like that. Um, and, and here, with cryptographic computation, you don't even need an attack. You don't need a microarchitectural issue. You know, for free, the system comes with, well, you can see the patterns. You can see what's changing. And so um, right from the get-go, you, uh, you can see what's in use. Uh, in some cases, that can be malleable too. You know, if there aren't enough protections on the data, you can still kind of change it from the outside and then see what happens. And that gives you all sorts of other avenues. So to our mind, you know, encryption as a primary protection made us pretty nervous. So instead, um, we went down the strong isolation route. We decided we would build the system in a way where Nitro just literally doesn't have access to the memory, right? And so most of the Nitro virtualization runs on those dedicated cards that I mentioned. On our virtualized instances, we also run a very thin hypervisor on the customer hardware just to manage um, the virtual instances. But that hypervisor, we designed it in a way where it's self-isolating. So it actually ring fences itself from the customer memory so that even if that hypervisor um, has a defect or an issue in it, that doesn't mean um, that there's a path to the EC2 instance memory or, or something like that. And then of course we designed it in a way where everything had to go through authenticated, encrypted APIs. And we make sure that those APIs uh, don't access data. And we've got actually automated testing that every release goes through that makes sure that you know, all of those APIs um, aren't touching or can't leak, um, can't leak the data that we're trying to protect. On top of that, the Nitro system runs in a highly isolated network that doesn't have internet access, doesn't have general access at Amazon or, or anything like that. And uh, we pay attention to the de debugging features too, to make sure that the de debugging features don't just, you know, reveal the contents of, of memory or a packet or, 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 uh, or something like that. And then, because we want to make sure we maintain a good posture against any potential future, um, you know, microarchitectural side channels or other issues that can emerge over time, we're very conservative uh, in our designs. So, for example, we never share. Um, CPU cores or L1 or L2 cache or anything like that between instances or between the hypervisor and instances um, because we want to make sure that nothing like that uh, could ever kind of uh, lock us out. And uh, that's how we built it for us, right? That's, that's how we built the Nitro system. So for you know, six or seven years, depending on the instance type, that's how EC2 has been running. Um, that's the reality we live in. But you know, working with customers is pretty clear. It's pretty high barrier to getting that kind of isolation as a customer. So I mean, I don't know how much investment went into building Nitro, but a lot. And so we also built AWS Nitro Enclaves, which essentially provides the benefits of the Nitro system for customers, so that customers can run workloads that they, as the customer, don't have access to. Um, and the way it works, is it's kind of recursive. Uh, we customer can launch an EC2 instance, uh, whatever size and shape they like, as long as it has at least um, two uh, CPU cores, and uh, and then they can run a command on that instance, and that'll create a highly isolated enclave environment. Um, it'll kind of carve it out from the from the instance's resources. So however much memory or CPU uh, cores you want to give to that enclave, you can specify it. And, and the underlying Nitro system will carve that out. And the enclave, it is, it is like a very hermetic system. It's like a dark box. There's no durable storage, no network access, no interactive access, no DNS, no NTP, none of that. It just runs whatever application the customer um, wants and uh, provides uh, some very, very basic uh, kind of security root of trust style services so that um, uh, you can get data in and out of it for secure processing. 
Uh, this is all built on the same kind of attestation I mentioned earlier. You know, when that enclave is spun up, the Nitro system verifies that enclave image, takes a checksum of it, and authenticates, you know, that software is, you know, this checksum. And then the software can create a public-private key pair and ask the attestation service, hey, I want you to verify I'm me, here's my public key. And then that public key with the attestation document uh, can be exported, and that's how data can be gotten into this service in a completely secure end-to-end -end way, where everything is getting, going in over encrypted channels, uh, and coming out over encrypted channels too, if you want, and nothing in between, not us, not the customer themselves could do it, um, could access it. And so we've got you know, customers who use Nitro Enclaves, for example, a simple example is maybe you've got a, a, a privacy sensitive data set that you wanna do some um, interesting work on, where you load the privacy sensitive data set inside the Enclave, the application does the interesting work and then releases only the safe results. Uh, if you want more data on this, or sorry, more information on this, we actually just released a white paper last week that goes into intensive detail uh, about the Nitro system and Nitro Enclaves and how it works. And it's very long and very detailed, and a lot of hard work went into it. Um, and it's well worth the read if you're particularly interested in this. If you can get all that way to having hermetic systems, um, you know, you can truly get into a posture where uh, the data is, um, you know, truly inaccessible. Uh, which I think is, a, a, you know, it's a good goal to have for all of us in the industry. Um, I think the key takeaways from the zero privilege operations work is I, I think we can all kind of reset just how fine-grained and just how granular we can make controls. They can be probably much more uh, fine-grained than you typically used to seeing out there. Um, that enabling you know, always-on accountability is on its own, a huge step that most people can actually take pretty easily. You know, if you're, if you're working in an organization or institution that doesn't have that posture today, I'd say, you know, try to make that a big priority for the next year because it, it generally um, always pays off and positions you for the, the further improvements that are gonna come down the line. Um, and lastly, that, you know, it really, it's increasingly easy, um, you know, to build these hermetic systems. We've seen customers and partners take Nitro Enclaves and within literally a day be able to run an application inside it in a very secure hermetic posture that they were never able to achieve before. With that, um, thank you all for coming. It's been a privilege to speak to you. Um, if you have questions, feel free to find me out in the hallway or, or somewhere else and we, I can handle them there. But thanks again. Thank you.